Bradbury. Hello there, Bradbury. <clears throat> Thursday, fourth of April. Egg hard, bacon cold, beans turned to mush, toast burnt, butter spoilt, jam a little sharp, tea stewed, cup chipped, never enough milk. Everything's your liking, sir. Oh. <laughs> Bradbury. Yes, everything was first rate. <laughs> Very good, sir. I'm not an easy man to please. I can be quite demanding, exacting. I'm known as something of a fuss pot. I wouldn't be wanting another pot of tea. A splendid idea. And would it be possible to have just a little more? Sir? No matter. No matter. Very good, sir. <laughs> Never enough milk. <laughs> Ah, good morning. Ah, oh, Paxton, my dear fellow, good morning. You know, I do hope I didn't disturb you this morning. You see, I am afflicted with being something of an early riser, but you... Well, you are on holiday. No need for concern. I was up and out early myself. I was determined not to miss the spectacular view of the sunrise from Blarney Point. Yes, I have something similar planned for tomorrow myself. And your plans for today? So much of the coastline demands exploration. Path steep, long way round, mud underfoot, grey skies, cold and damp, breeze, little fears. Now I find I am somewhat weighed down by correspondence this morning. Uh, perhaps later on I shall find a moment to escape. I'm not a man who tends to stop. I find it hard relaxing, unwinding. I'm known as something of a workhorse, but you are free to see the country and what's more to explore the coast. Make the most of your liberty. Well, I, I shouldn't delay you any further. I'd only come in the hope of securing the use of the hotel bicycle if you have no use for it. I plan to head out to find the church of Froston if first I can find Bradbury, that is. Good morning. Good morning. Warm fire. Comfy chair. Something to distract. <coughs> Outside, the winter's night was cold and wet. Outside the winter's night was cold and wet. Most people are accustomed to traveling the road from London to York. Is that three times then waiting? The wind whistled through the trees in the distance. The bell was tolling the midnight hour. made up his mind to abandon the city and to find somewhere by himself to study for his final examinations. He feared the attractions of the seaside and the charms of rural isolation, and so he came to arrive at Fenchurch, a sleepy little market town. Following a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast at the Good Traveller, Malcolmson went out in search of quarters for the month. He found an old rambling house of the... Jacobean style. This house, the very spot to provide the needed quiet and tranquility. 
from the post office, he got directions to the offices of the agent, a Mr. Khan. Ah, good morning. Uh, I'm looking to rent a room here in Benchurch for the coming month. Somewhere quiet, nothing to distract. Something singular and striking would attract. Oh, well, please sit down, sir. You are speaking to the right man, Mr. Carnford. I oversee all available properties in the town. As a matter of fact, I have found a perfect place already. We currently have a good number of possibilities. An old house, heavy set. Flat roof, plain parapet. The narrow windows positioned peculiarly high against the sky a stark imposing silhouette a wall of solid brick to keep the world aloof and stranger still to tell hanging high above the roof a rusty danger bell I don't know which one you mean <laughs> must know it. There's no other like it in the town. <laughs> Look, I, I was assured by the landlady, the good traveller in, that it was uninhabited and that you were the appropriate agent. We plenty of other rooms, we plenty of better rooms, rooms that are bigger, rooms that are smarter, rooms that are cheaper. One overlooks the market square, it's well maintained in good repair. The view is pleasant and the price is fair. We plenty of other rooms, we plenty of nicer rooms, we plenty of better rooms. A quiet place down by the brook, a modest haunt, a homely nook, well worth the money, so well worth the look. The money is of no concern to me. I've told you of the house where I'd like to take up my lodgings. Now, can you arrange it? It'll take some time in the sorting, but it is possible, sir. The rent will be four guineas for the month to be paid in advance. Four guineas for peace and solitude. Four guineas for blessed isolation. Four guineas buys freedom from distraction. A thousand things that thwart a scholar's concentration. But perhaps in this instance, you can pay me after having spent the night there first, just to be certain. <laughs> well, if you insist. But I can move in today. Today? Impossible! There's the cleaning, the dusting, the tidying, and ordering, and organising, on account of being all these years left uninhabited. <laughs> Sorry, but no, sir. Uh, no. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes! Yes, we can be for a clock today And may you have a peaceful and most pleasant stay Here in Benchurch I'm sure that Mrs. Denham will prove more than equal to the task One more thing, Mr. Carnford well, When I spoke, spoke with the landlady of the good traveller in She went a queer shade of white at the mention of the house she even went as far as to say, I wouldn't spend an hour alone in that house for all the money in Drinkwater's bank. <laughs> With all due respect, sir, you don't want to pay too much heed to what she says. <laughs> that may be fair. But then you yourself seem reluctant to let me have a room there. <laughs> Only on account of all the work involved, sir. Listen, I'm curious. I'm not easily agitated, so tell me, in all honesty, is there some superstition or other concerning this house? Some superstition? Well, yes, Mr. Comfort. Simple enough question. <laughs> well, some folk believe the place to be inhabited. They greatly fear the noises that they hear. They won't go near, come day or night. Such noises. Strange noises that could give even scholars a fright. And what do you believe? 
What do I believe? <laughs> An old house not lived in for as long as anyone can remember. Rats, mice, maybe beetles, cracks, floors, maybe pains, cracking doors, running trains every time it rains. Falling slates and bombies, mice, rats is bogeys and bogeys is rats. At around eight o'clock, Malcolm soon returned from his supper at the Good Traveller to a warm and cosy room. This is comfort indeed. He got out his books, and he set himself down to a spell of hard work. <clears throat> the hyperbolic tangent is equal to the hyperbolic sine divided by the hyperbolic cosine. So e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by e. Himself a cup of tea. The fire threw quaint shadows through the great old room, and as he sipped his hot tea, he reveled in the sense of isolation. It was then that he began to notice for the first time what a noise the rats were making. Surely they can't have been there all the time I was reading. Rats, bogies, and bogies is rats. There were some old pictures on the walls, but they were coated so thick with dust and dirt that he could not distinguish any of the detail. Here and there, as he went about, he saw some hole or crack blocked for a moment by the face of a rat, its bright eyes glittering in the light, but in an instant it was gone. What most struck him, however, was the rope of the great alarm bell on the roof, hanging to the right-hand side of the fireplace. He examined it closely, and then went back to his work. sat an enormous black rat, steadily glaring at him with baleful eyes. What shoo! Shoo! It did not stir, but showed its great white teeth angrily, and its cruel eyes shone in the lamplight with an added vindictiveness. Rats is bogies. by the darkness. upon you too early. I was eager to see whether the night had passed peacefully for you. <laughs> no doubt eager to collect your four guineas. Please, sir, I had no concern in that regard. But you are looking a little paler this morning than you should. You must not overdo it, sir. Brother, the night was long, but it was a profitable one. And no bogies came to bother me. <laughs> No, no, nothing at all except the rats. And even sitting on this chair, I saw an old devil staring at me. An old devil, did you say? Yes, Mr. Khan, but sitting on this very chair. <laughs> Take care, sir, please. Oh, an old devil sitting on that chair. There's many a true word spoken in jest. How do you mean? An old devil. The old devil, perhaps. 
But to their say, they didn't laugh. You young folk always laughing at things that make older ones shudder. But I tell you no lie. The old devil is precisely what they used to call him. My dear man, I meant you no offence. But I do protest I haven't the slightest notion what or who you're speaking of. A man who was harsh and heartless, who took a sadistic pleasure in the suffering of the unfortunate's court on the wrong side of the law. No pity would prick his conscience, no mercy hold back his rank. And the severity of the punishments handed down to the guilty meant he was feared, a man revered, held in the greatest terror. The noose was never far from his thoughts. The black cap always close to his right. Tall enough to stand before he in the dark. Guilty, guilty, guilty and condemned. No matter how vile or savage. Before him a brute became a mouse. No doubt the devil. And this, the judge's house. <laughs> well, that evening, the scampering of the rats began even earlier. Indeed, it had been going on before his return from the good travel. Hyperbolic tangent is equal to x plus x to the 3 divided by 3 plus 2x to the 5 divided by 15 minus 17x to the 7 divided by 350 as it converges to infinity. How they scampered up and down and under and over, and how they squeaked and scratched and gnawed. <laughs> discovered a hole in one of the great old pictures which hung on the walls. But the portrait was largely obscured through its thick coating of dust and cobwebs. Ah! It's the card, but just the man. Is everything the matter, sir? Oh, far from it. Uh, but if you'll indulge me, I have a request. A request? Oh, this afternoon, I plan to take an hour or so to explore the local byways. I'm intrigued by the portraits on the wall of the house. Except I can see hardly anything except thick dust and cobwebs. One portrait especially intrigues me. Uh, I was wondering, when I'm out, could someone stop by to eradicate the decades of neglect? I dare say Mrs. Denham would be most happy to oblige. <laughs> Is there any particular reason for your keen interest in them? Last night, I happened again to see my friend Black Rat. When I hurled my books at him, he scampered up to Bell Pool and disappeared. The Bell Pool? Uh, the, the Bell Pool. The Bell Pool. <laughs> <laughs> that 
Plainly, I neither believe in nor fear bogies. Malcolmson's afternoon stroll was pleasant enough, but he returned to his lodgings enthusiastic to see the results of Mrs. Denham's industry. of scarlet and ermine, and seated in a high-backed carved oak chair, sat the figure of a judge. His face was strong, merciless, evil, crafty, and vindictive. began to sound. A crowd soon assembled. They knocked loudly at the door, but there was no reply. Then they burst in, 
Mr. Carnford at the head. There, at the end of the rope of the great alarm bell, hung the body of the student. And on the face of the judge in the picture was a malignant smile. Breakfast, sir? Um, no, thank you, Bradbury, though it was as delicious as ever. Um, it's merely that I seem to be somewhat lacking my usual appetite this morning. Sorry to hear that, sir. I'm not an easy man to please. I can be quite Excuse me, sir. Just, just a minute. <laughs> Perhaps I could manage a little more of the egg. Very good, sir. No doubt I shall be. Uh, grateful for the sustenance before the morning is through. A walk, is it, Sam? Perhaps I should wait till the evening, give the weather a chance to brighten up a little. Forecast is a promising. <laughs> Come, the rain never hurt anyone. They say storms. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> Do they indeed? Hmm. Well, it seems our friend is not so easily discouraged. Sir? Up and about again early, I believe. Yeah. The gentleman took the late train yesterday evening, having been unexpectedly called away. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing too serious, I hope. I Did should you let you get on, sir. Yes, yes, thank you, Frederick. They <laughs> <laughs> do have so much to do. So much to do. Outside the winter's night was cold and wet The wind whistled through the trees This story may seem unbelievable When he heard a voice calling to him, he was standing at the door of his signal box. But instead of looking up to where I stood, he, he turned himself about and, and looked down the line. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing this. Remarkable enough that it attracted my attention from my vantage point high above him, where I was all but blinded by an angry sunset. Hello! Down below there! Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? I looked down at him. Reluctant to press him again too soon with my idle question. Please, down below there! Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? He regarded me with fixed attention. Thank you. 
and yet he never flinched nor rectified his stance. He says no strange to comprehend the dark the moonlight tunnel, strange foreboding. charge, is it not? Why, you look at me as if you were afraid of me. I thought I'd seen you somewhere before. Where? There. Uh, my good fellow, what should I do there? <laughs> Be that as it may, uh, I never was there. If you say so, sir. Uh, Fred, the evening is damp and cold. Would you permit me to presume upon your hospitality and beg a cup of something warm to drink? Sir? Uh, would it be possible to have a cup of something warm to drink? Oh, follow me, sir. He led me into his signal box, where there was a fire, a desk for a, an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial, face, needles, and a bell. And have you worked at this signal for long? This march will mark the start of my 27th year, sir. 27 years? Well, I must find the work to be absorbing. Absorbing? Mm, engaging. Stimulating. Or at least challenging. So many levers, switches and controls uh, to the untrained eye, it's quite bewildering. Forgive me saying, sir. I think you may suffer from some rather romantic notions. <laughs> it's not a job that's hard. <clears throat> the tasks are hardly taxing. It's just a job and not the kind that will stimulate the mind and leave you physically exhausted. Experience won't help. Nor will ignorance impede you. Trim these lights, turn this sample, pull this lever, change the signal, and then... Um, your duties may seem insignificant, but without fine men such as yourself carrying out these tasks, this great industrial age would shudder to a halt. There's precious little pride or sense of satisfaction. And at the end of one more day, the very best that you can say is, thank God that nothing happened. Tonight, the same as yesterday. Tomorrow night will be no different. Trim these lights, turn this handle, pull this lever, change the signal, and then... So many hours, these books the only company I've got. Even in this damp and sunless spot So many days, so many nights The same unchanging aspect The same signal, the same angle The same lever, the same lights The loneliness could kill me If not the ways of each and every soul I hold within my mind I looked about me with interest at his cramped and dimly lit cell I noted with some surprise both the quantity of books on the shelves and the many and varied subjects they addressed. Latin, natural philosophy, algebra. These subjects are hardly insubstantial. 
I wasn't chosen for my flair or some prodigious hidden talent. The demands are pretty small, I hardly use my brain at all, just as long as I'm still breathing. I read to pass the time. I don't pretend to be a scholar. Trim these lights, turn this angle, pull this lever, change the signal, and then so many hours in summer, winter, sun or wind or rain, staring once again through this grand or wind or pain. The same unchanging aspect, the same signal, the same angle, the same lever, the same light. Nor to do but stare and meditate upon the dreadful burden that I bear. So many nights, so many hours, minutes, seconds, God, so many lives. dedication for so many years, it must bring you some sort of contentment, does it not? Used to, sir. But I'm troubled. But what? It is very difficult to talk about. Maybe if you make me another visit. Oh, but I expressly intend to make you another visit. I'm here for a few more days. Uh, say, when shall it be? I'll go off early in the morning, and she'll be on again at five o'clock tomorrow night. Then I will come at six. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, when you reach the top, don't call out. Ah, very well. Uh, and when you come again tomorrow, don't call out. As you say. Well then, um, good night. Sir, can I ask you one question? What made you cry? Hello, below there, earlier this evening. Ah, heaven knows. I cried something to that effect. No, no, not to that effect. Those are the very words. I know them well. Admitting those were my very words, I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any way? No. No, not in the least. No. Of course not, sir. It were foolish of me to suggest it. Oh, think nothing of it. I shall return tomorrow evening, but now I must uh, leave you to your duties and your books. Good night, friend. Good night, sir. He held up his lamp, and I made my way along the embankment until I found my path. I've decided, sir, that you should not have to ask me twice what troubles me. Yesterday, I took you for someone else. That troubles me. That's a mistake. That's someone else. Who was it? Don't know. Never saw the face. Sake, 
double count! I put my feet the rest of change. Not even pausing for the long breath. I think I'm wild with desperation. It's right on waving thus. His face can't shield it by his left. Straight down the steps, my heart was pounding. Look out, look out, he cried with fright. The swirling fog was thick around him. And then I swear I saw the poor man disappear from sight. I run towards the tunnel's mouth. of sight, perhaps. And as to these imaginary cries, one only needs to pause a moment to listen to the wind in the Begging valley. your pardon, sir, but I'd not finished. Within six hours of the appearance, the memorable incident on this line occurred. to my duties, not missing a day's work. About six months passed without incident, and I'd recovered from the surprise and the shock, when one morning, just as day was breaking, I was standing at the door and looked towards the red light at the mouth of the tunnel.
What is it? What is it? Where is the danger? Answer me! Tell me what to do! Go on. That very day, just as the morning train came out of the tunnel, somehow in what looked like a confusion of hands and heads, a young lady was thrown violently from the carriage. No. This is true, sir. They brought her in, laid out her body on the floor between us. Her husband had just two weeks sat in that very chair. Spirit. He calls to me for many minutes together, stands there waving at me. And the strange, unnatural ring of a warning bell within its presence. Uh, and you can hear it now, the ringing unlike any I've ever heard before. And uh, do you see this spectre now? Look carefully. No, sir. It is not there. Agreed. My friend, you must listen to me and compose yourself. Let us say that all these things are true. They are true, sir. So be it. Uh, uh, very well. Um, but try to take heed of this. Any man who discharges his duty will do well. There is no more that you can do. And I have studied you these past nights, and I am convinced that no man could work with greater diligent attention or responsibility. I hope so, sir. I'm certain of the fact. And as to these appearances, why, you, you cannot be called upon to interpret such things. Believe me, take comfort in your duties. You cannot be to blame. <laughs>
I believe you may be right in what you say, sir. I know that I am. I will continue my duties and do my best to put these other matters out of my mind. I'm very glad to hear you say it. I believe you've helped me tonight, sir. And I'm thankful for it. <laughs>
Bradbury. Hello there, Bradbury. <clears throat> Friday, 5th of April. Supper. Soup cold. <coughs> Bread hard. Never enough salt. Will you be wanting the beef or the tripe and carrot pie, sir? <laughs> beef tough. Pie stale. Never enough salt. I think the beef. Thank you, Bradbury. The <laughs> beef. <laughs> with, with perhaps just a little of the pie on the side as an accompaniment. And the pie. Perfect. And would it be possible to have just a little? Sir, no matter. <laughs> no matter. Very good, sir. Never enough salt. Now the wanderer returns. Come, sit down. You look like you're greatly in need of some nourishment. The soup is... Well, it's soup. Mm. Bradbury said you've been called away. Um, yes. Nothing too serious, I hope. You know, the weather has been utterly wretched. Although it's fortunate that I am one of those rare souls who find the wind and rain exhilarating. Mm. Will you try to quite right? Your beef and your pie, sir. Oh, Mr. Paxton! Mm, something to drink. Have some brandy. Certainly, sir. Uh, and is there anything more exhilarating than camping in a one-man tent on the edge of a cliff, overlooking a sea in the middle of a raging storm? Your brandy, sir. Uh, no, uh, wait one moment. Um. <laughs> Please. Very good, sir. Uh, and Bradbury, be a good chap and get another log for the fire, would you? Sir. <laughs> Mr. Long, uh, please forgive my agitation. You'll think it very odd of me, but, but the fact is I've had something of a shock. My friend, there's no need for apology. but. If there's anything I can do to be of assistance, perhaps it, it would be good to, to tell me exactly what has happened. As you believe me to be insane. Oh, I will listen to whatever you have to say without judgment. I hardly know where to begin. I suppose the start of it all was when I bicycled over to Froston to see the church there. Such a beautiful building, an especially beautiful stretch of coastline. No doubt you two have walked the paths. <laughs> They're on my list. <laughs> Everything so calm, so still. The morning mist was slowly dissipating, and yet a chill hung in the air. I am right, am I not? I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. I was saying that there are few sights on God's earth so spectacular as to match the one here before you. Yes. I have been here nearly 30 years and still I do not tire of it. A man may lose his faith in God, but never in the beauty of his creation. Or indeed in the artistry of those he created. The skilled masonry about the porch there is one of the finest examples of its kind. Um, but that coat of arms there, uh, the three crowns, I've not seen it before. Is it the arms of the Kingdom of East Anglia? Yes. It's a curious piece of local folklore. In Saxon times, if the story is to be believed, three holy crowns were buried to protect the coastline from invasion. And such a crown was dug up not far from here in... 1687, though alas, melted down. The second is said to have been lost to the encroaching sea, but to this day it is held by many in these parts that the third crown still lies buried somewhere. What 
What a fascinating story. Ha! <laughs> Stuff and nonsense. Stuff and nonsense. The things they believe in. Blind superstition. Foolish prattle. Tittle tattle. The fiction they weave. The stories they tell. A sneeze is your soul trying to take flight. Good fortune will follow red sky at night. Knock on wood. Cross your fingers. Never marry. Stuff and nonsense, stuff and nonsense, the things these locals believe. Come, come, such superstition may be a little quaint. There's no harm in seeking a little peace and assurance. No harm. Well, think on this. And shortly after I arrived here, well, nearly 30 years ago, I visited the bedside of a dying man, still relatively young. His name was William Ager, and for generations in times of war, the oldest male in his family had sat out at night, watching the spot where they believed the crown to be buried. There's no doubt that the consumptive fever that killed him was very much hastened by his exposure to the elements night after night as he sat watching. I'm sorry. <clears throat> stuff and nonsense, stuff and nonsense, the things they believe in blind superstition, foolish prattle, tittle tattle, the fiction they weave, the stories they tell. A bird in the house is a sign of death when passing a graveyard. Hold your breath. peace in his death. And William was the last, you see. There was no son to follow him. He died racked with guilt in the knowledge that he was leaving his cursed mythical crown without a guardian. <laughs> he died in Zebra, I think. Which my map informed me was just a few miles further around the coast. In truth, I would have probably thought no more about it. Had it not been for an extraordinary coincidence. But where to begin? Well, fate opened the door. Yes! <laughs> um, yes, I, I was looking to buy. Yes! <laughs> Nothing in, in particular. <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, 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 what do you have? My dear young friend, this humble and unassuming emporium contains the universe. And with that note, I determined to make a speedy exit. <laughs> Until my attention was arrested by... Oh my god, that's miraculous. Nathaniel Ager, 1712 to 1766. The flowers bloom and fade away And no one mourns their going For soon a mother by God's hand Is wonderfully growing Though man may strive and man may toil to serve some grand endeavor, we like the flowers pass away, for nothing lasts forever. The sparrow is content to build his nest in humble hollow. Tell me, uh, what do you want for this book? Oh, it is a rare book. With a 1720 edition, now over 150 years old. It's a beautiful binding, gilt edging, and an excellent condition. Now, half a guinea. 
<laughs> and I'll give you the same again if you can tell me anything more about this uh, Nathaniel Ager and his family. I'm especially interested in uh, William Ager. He died here a little less than 30 years ago. <laughs> yes, I remember William. I didn't know him well. Something of a, a solitary <clears throat> figure. <laughs> Lodged in a cottage by the North Field. The one on the end, uninhabited now. <laughs> yeah. What's he to you? Why all these questions? On leaving the shop, I made my way directly to the North Fifth, where I planned, by some means as yet unknown, to strike up some sort of acquaintance with the people there. Once again, fate intervened, when my powers of invention had failed me. Get down! Get down! I say, sir, is this your dog? Well, call him off! Call off at once, man! Uh, quickly! Arthur, away! Dangerous brute of an animal. You should keep him tied up. Tied up? Oh, it isn't safe giving a wild beast free reign to terrorize bypassers. And who are you exactly to be passing by? <laughs> if you happen to have lost your way, then the coastal path is further down that way, and a good deal closer to the sea. <laughs> um, listen here. I, I meant you no offense. Just a little taken aback is all. And I'm not here by chance. I was wondering if you could tell me anything about William Ager. William Ager? I believe that cottage on the end there was his, was it not? And that he died here some 30 years ago. But can you tell me in what circumstances? Yeah, what is all this? Why is a gentleman such as yourself interested in the likes of William Ager? And then I'm ashamed to say I did a terrible thing. Some months previously, my father died. And amongst his possessions, I found this. It's an old family heirloom. I discovered that his grandfather moved to the city as a young man, but was born here in Seabra. Nathaniel Ager. Well, um, surely it isn't a bad thing to wish to know more of one's ancestors. Forgive me, sir. I mistook your motives. You were asking about William Ager. Uh, I knew him well. We grew up together. Uh, School together, and as young men work the land together. <laughs> well, there's many a story I could tell you about William Ager. And he proceeded to do just that. But as time passed, he seemed to change. What do you know about how he came to die? Oh, only that he was young. Oh, too many nights spent out in all manner of weather. Oh, he was a fisherman. Oh, no, no. He used to sit at night. Watching, waiting for the morning sun, watching like his father once had done. Consumption got him in the end. He died alone without a friend. Watching, but who can say what for? Watching, but no one watches anymore. All through the night, atop that lonely hill. Say, perhaps he's watching still. <laughs> Forgive me, sir, you silly old fool. And please, don't ask me to say no more. Oh, no, uh, of course. <laughs> oh, thank you. Arthur! <sighs> you were a good man. You always meant to do right. And there's not many you can say that of these days. Is there, sir? No. But, but what did you do next? Surely you don't believe that such a crown could actually exist. Oh, but it does exist. Oh, well, how can you know we should be known for sure? Because I have found it. Because I have found the crown. And I have stolen it. <laughs> Magnificent. 
it So roughly crafted yet resplendent Majestic The many centuries cannot diminish Your grace exciting finds these shores have ever seen. I, I beg your pardon. Look, you've been very kind, but the truth is that since I touched it, I've never been alone. I arrived at the mouth, a deserted spot, started searching around, and suddenly he was there. I began to prospect, looking for some clue, but my progress was checked at every turn. He was there. He was there, a man always standing just behind a tree to the left, to the right, always, but never quite so I could see. Not there. In Was gone. What else was I to do but carry on? I returned to my room, tired from the day, but the shadowy gloom further troubled me. He was there. It was silent and calm, but I could not sleep. He intended me harm, but would not give up. He was watching me with close attention, watching me with cold detachment, watching me, waiting for his moment. He
has lost the prize. With little care into my bag was crammed, all hope was gone. This vengeful spirit I had crossed would not be pacified until my soul was damned. How happy I once was. How carefree and content. Too much to forgive. Too late to repent. My fate unchangeable. My life is surely certain to be I return to my room and I try to sleep, but the dark was a tomb and the demon was there. treasure, however precious, is worth one's sanity and peace. If it will help, then tomorrow we'll return to the spot together, and as you have determined, we'll bury this crown so deeply in the earth it will never again be discovered. I give you my word, I will not disclose the location of the crown to another soul, nor speak of its ex existence to anybody. Then let us go. Now! now. <laughs> it's still the middle of the night. We, we have to go now! We should wait till the morning. This will go at first light. I will even forgo my breakfast. No! But uh, we won't be able to work all the quicker for having had a good night's sleep. Uh, no! If what I have found can be returned before dawn, then, then there might still be a chance, the, the, the smallest possible hope of appeasing this, this hellish evil that I have unleashed. Please. Friend, this is deeply ill advised. i 
us uh, the unnatural pattern in the leaves, how the earth has been freshly disturbed. We should move quickly. I have no desire to linger a moment longer.